Alrighty, so permanent hardness. You're not going to get rid of it by boiling. And this time it is sulfates and chlorides. So it's still calcium and magnesium, but now it's sulfates and chlorides. So hardness is due to calcium and magnesium. Temporary hardness is carbonates. Permanent hardness are sulfates or chlorides. So calcium and magnesium will always be common. It's the ending that changes. So if I can't get rid of it by boiling, what chemical techniques do you think I could do to end up with pure water? Ion exchange. So ion exchange, absolutely. Is one. Mr. Duncan used to have one in his room to make um, distilled water. How do you make distilled water? Distillation. With distillation. Is it okay to come off this? Yeah. Take that as a yes. So distillation is a way to get rid of both types of hardness. You're left then with literally pure H2O. Um, there may be... Um, so that it literally is pure H2O, no nothing, no dissolved salts, no dissolved gases, no suspended solid. It literally just is pure H2O. Washing soda, you probably are not old enough and your grannies probably have changed their washing machines. But before, once upon a time, there was top loaders for washing machines. And you literally would put in washing soda into your top loader. And that would soften your water first. And then you'd add in your clothes. So this is when we did our acid base titrations. Remember we have to find the value of X. That's the stuff that we use. So this is just showing you if you have calcium in your water and you have carbonate ions, they will make calcium carbonate that come out of solution. And your sodium ions will stay dissolved.
Okay, so Dan, this is your last part for you, and then you'll be on your way. So for an ion exchange, the resin has sodium ions in it, and it literally, when you pour your water through it, it swaps the calcium and magnesium out and puts the sodium ions back into the water, and that's what makes it soft. So you have this little picture. So these are all the little sodium ions that are in your resin. You pass your sample through it and they literally swap places. So now eventually your resin will stop working because the calcium will have filled it all up. And you've now made soft water. So the ore here in this little formula is for resin. So it's essentially saying calcium ions coming in to your resin. And now the calcium ions stay on your resin and your sodium now leaves. So boiling is only going to remove temporary hardness. If you have permanent hardness, you are going to use ion exchange. Now, Dan, you this is where your theory ends. So page 162, it's page 162 on mine. Is it 162 on yours, guys? What's the page on yours? 161. So, Dan, bottom of page 161 is now where you finish. I have put, the assignment has pinged, so there's you have certain homework questions for you. And I will send you back your paper today, and you, we, you can, you'll have to communicate back to me. But chances are Monday and Tuesday's lesson, you won't be with us. Okay, yeah, we will talk and we'll figure it out. Okay, so you can now leave. Lucky you. Bye. He doesn't have to look so happy about it. Okay, so the last bit that we have, yeah. What's the resin? So the resin is just essentially, it's, it's usually it's a type of bead. And it's a bead that you're capable. So the example here is that it's a, a salt of a carboxylic acid. Can you see the COO in the little resin picture? Yeah, yeah. So all it is, is it is a solid bead and they're able to stick things onto it. So here they've gotten some type of salt of some type of carboxylic acid onto it that, that has the sodium on it and the carboxylic salt portion will stay attached to your bead and it's just the the sodium or the calcium is the thing that swaps yeah okay thanks if you if you have a water softener in your house and you have like guys that come to service it you should ask them to to see the the resin so like it's a little plastic tube i would have shown you the ones that i have in school and inside in the one in school it actually looks like it's a sponge but usually they're they're little beads Okay. okay now the water we use in school isn't what's called fully deionized to do that we need what's called a mixed bed resin so it's doing both cation exchange and anion exchange and this has real implications for the guys that work in who are the people that make computer chips we all have the little sticker on our laptops that's Intel. Intel. So Intel would have to use fully deionized water. There are certain medical applications that would have to, to use it. Um, and what you're doing here is you are taking positive and negative ions out of your water and all you are leaving it with is pure water. So in our deionized water, the ion exchange, we are just swapping the positive ions out. But for to make it fully deionized we're swapping the negative so we're taking chlorides and any other like sulfites any of those things out and we're swapping it for oh minus so this is our resin the bead and it now has a hydroxyl group attached to it and we pour it through our water and the chlorine in the water or the chloride in the water swaps places and it leaves us with oh minus ions in solution this time anything positively charged so the sodium it could be calcium it could be anything it will swap for a h and now i have h plus and oh minus in my water and both of those things together make um 
make me um, H2O. So deionized isn't as pure as distilled because you can have dissolved gases in there that you're not going to, to get rid of. Whereas distilling will push everything out. You're just literally evap heating and evaporating to get the pure water. But deionized, you may have dissolved gases in there. The way we deionize, so the deionize that we used in school, we have issues with both dissolved gases in there and with dissolved salts because we're only swapping the calcium or magnesium for sodium so that's the big issue this in, in the thing where it says difference between deionized and distilled water so deionized water is okay i will can I do we have everything on this screen and I will write that part for you. So do you have your little oh, equations? And I because I just need a bigger screen. Okay, I'm gonna go out of this and we will go into this. Close that saving. So deionized water is non-ionic because you've gotten rid of your ions, but there will be dissolved gases, some other dissolved solids, and you may even have suspended solids in there. Whereas pure H2O has nothing but water molecules. And as you said, it's used in computer chip manufacture. And it has medical applications. So they can ask this question um, when we do the redox titrations. So if we use deionized water in our redox titrations, we can get a cloudy um, result. And it's because that there's the dissolved gases are in there and they're going to be reacting. Um, miss, what does it say after titrations on the top? So you get a cloudy result with DI in the redox. So one of the questions they can ask is why would you use distilled water for redox titrations? And the reason being deionized water has contains dissolved substances that would interfere. Can I change my share? Take that as a yes. Alrighty, so we're gonna look at, we have, there's only two titrations left on your course. And one of them is what's called total hardness of water. So there are a couple of things. We have this name of this chemical, it's called EDTA. You're gonna to have to know its full name, but there are certain things that you have to have for EDTA to be able to work. 
So we, I will, what I'll do is we'll go through the theory. I'll send you the link for the video and we'll allow you then to watch that on your own time before we see each other next time. So in terms of total hardness, we are titrating it with a standard solution of this ginormous name. And you have to know the ginormous name. It is called ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, EDTA for short. So it is a mouthful. Ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. You don't have to be able to draw the structure, but this is what it looks like. So this is the ethylene part. This is the diamine. And there are four acetic acids, which is the old school name for ethanoic acid. But they can ask you, what does EDTA stand for? So essentially we titrate the water against our EDTA and what it will do is it the EDTA literally takes any calcium and magnesium ions that are in solution and the, the chemistry words to describe them are it sequesters them or chelates them. It literally grabs onto them. So once it does that, it forms what's called a complex. So we're not making a compound now, we're just making a complex. So that is both ionic and covalent in character. They're kind of weird. And we don't really do the, that this chemistry for leaving cert. But it literally, if there's any calcium and magnesium in your solution, EDTA just kind of grabs a hold of it. And But the pH has to be above 9 for EDTA to be able to do that. Our ratio is always going to be 1 to 1. But because this is such a ginormous name, they give you a real general equation. So you will never see an equation that will have the formula for EDTA and then your calcium and magnesium. They'll, they'll write it indirectly. Okay, so in biology, when we did our enzyme experiments, we would have used um, pH buffer. So here we put in pH buffer 10 into our conical flask and that's going to guarantee um, that we have the right conditions for EDTA to work. So when we do this experiment we can figure out when somebody hasn't added in their pH buffer because they never get an endpoint and it's emotionally scarring. So how it works, EDTA forms stable complexes with calcium or magnesium when pH is greater than 1. Your pH level is achieved with your pH buffer 10. Okay, so we have this part, we still have this part, we still have this part. So EDTA can't distinguish between calcium and magnesium. And that's why, and it's called total hardness. There is, if you ever do chemistry in university, in first year, you will do this experiment again, total hardness, and you also do an experiment for magnesium hardness, and then you take one from the other to get calcium hardness. But as it stands now for us, we are just doing total hardness of water, but we express our results as calcium carbonate. And as you said earlier, parts per million is the same as milligrams per litre. So in a titration, usually in our mats, we always go grams per litre is one of the things the SEC look for. And then we just have to do that conversion at the end. OK, so for some reason, this is I'm on page one, six, three, I think. Yeah. No, it's just in the bottom where I'm too close. Yeah, I'm going to come back. So that's, I don't know why it hasn't come up here. So there, as I say, there's no going to be no proper equation. And as the titration doesn't distinguish between calcium or magnesium ions, where it says the so M2 plus plus H2 Y2 minus goes to M Y2 minus plus H2 H plus, that's going to be the equation they're going to give you. I'm going to just oh, okay. come off this screen for one second. It must come up in a later slide, so I apologize. But so this will be or a version of it. It'll be what they give you H2Y2 
2 minus goes to my 2 minus plus 2h plus. So this is your calcium or your magnesium. And this is your EDTA. And this is the complex that forms. So you're never going to see in your equation calcium or magnesium, but your ratio is going to be one to one. So the M2 plus is your metal and the H2Y2 minus is your EDTA. Okay, I'm going to change if that's all right. So this then is going at the top of the next page. Total hydrogen is expressed as parts per million calcium carbonate, which is the exact same as milligrams per liter. So we'll come back to the little diagram in a second, but EDTA is always stored in plastic containers. And the reason for that is because the EDTA will go after the, the metal ions in the glass. And literally, I have seen glass bottles, somebody's picked it up and it literally has just disintegrated in front of them. So the whole pH 10 and plastic containers would be your two extra points. So just in terms of our little pieces of blurb, this is, would be our experimental setup. Our EDTA is going to go into our burette. And in our titration flask, we'll have our water, our pH buffer 10. And this is our indicator down here. It's called Aerochrome T. And it's a powder indicator. And when we get to use it, you need to use the smallest bit you can possibly get onto a spatula. We are talking smidgens. It's a very technical word, smidgen. So aerochrome T is our indicator and it is very pretty. So it goes from a wine red to a blue. So this is where we're going to leave it. There are homework questions that relate to the hardness theory. There's nothing on the experiment. You have the QR code in your book. That should get you to the Chemistry Live um, titration blurb. So have a look at that before next Monday. And on Monday, we look at the mats that go with this. There is nothing new in the mats at all. So if you're as happy as you can be, then you get, you're off for another 25 minutes. So is there anything you'd like to ask before you go? Um, miss, uh, 